Ah, okay, this is I'm going to say up here. Yes. Bonjour, uh, mesdames et messieurs. Nous sommes heureux de vous accueillir ce matin au pavillon de la francophonie. Je le disais hier encore, l'OME est un partenaire de l'Organisation internationale de la francophonie. Aujourd'hui, l'occasion nous est donnée de parler d'énergie pour uh, la région de la Méditerranée. Et pour la francophonie, c'est un sujet important. Rappelez-vous que l'énergie est au cœur de l'action que les États également de la francophonie, impliqués dans la mise en œuvre de l'accord de Paris, doivent mettre en place. Et souvenez-vous également que l'accord de Paris nous invite à travailler, à parvenir à un équilibre entre les émissions de gaz à effet de serre et les efforts que nous déployons. Ce que je peux appeler la neutralité carbone est une ambition importante et l'énergie, les efforts en termes d'énergie renouvelable, les efforts en matière de réduction de, de, de l'utilisation des énergies fossiles est une ambition très importante pour laquelle nous devons travailler sur des synergies. Et c'est pour cela que nous sommes heureux que la thématique aujourd'hui porte sur l'énergie. Nous remercions l'OME pour ses efforts et la francophonie ne manquera pas d'apporter sa contribution à cette action de l'OME. Sans plus tarder, je vous remercie pour ceux qui sont en ligne et pour ceux qui sont dans la salle. Et je souhaite un bel événement pour ce matin. Merci beaucoup. Euh, merci encore. À à la francophonie, à l'IFDD, de nous recevoir ici. Nous sommes très heureux de lancer notre Mediterranean Energy Perspective ici, sur le pavillon de la francophonie. Avec l'IFDD, nous avons une coopération depuis de longues dates, notamment avec l'Université méditerranéenne d'été, où on a commencé depuis longtemps à parler de transition énergétique et de développement énergétique durable. Et donc, nous espérons bien évidemment renforcer et nous ne doutons pas que nous allons renforcer ces liens avec vous parce que l'OME croit aussi que le partenariat se fait non seulement au sein de la Méditerranée, mais aussi avec les pays voisins, avec l'Afrique, avec les pays du Middle East. Et nous sommes très honorés de la présence de ma princesse donc pour, pour voilà, échanger et savoir ce qui se fait en Méditerranée et développer des actions futures à l'avenir. Permettez-moi aussi de remercier l'ensemble des membres de l'OME et la Commission européenne qui a apporté son soutien à ce travail. Donc, un travail de plus d'un an acharné de l'équipe de l'OME que je salue ici, et en particulier Lisa Garrera qui a coordonné ce travail, mais également l'ensemble des membres qui ont soutenu par leur soutien financier, mais également par la lecture minutieuse des résultats que nous allons vous proposer ici. Donc, l'Observatoire méditerranéen, c'est une association qui existe aujourd'hui depuis 30 ans. J'aime à dire que non, notre nom ne reflète pas tout à fait ce qu'on fait. Nous ne se faisons pas qu'observer l'énergie, mais nous allons au-delà de l'observation, l'analyse, euh, porter la voix de l'industrie sur le secteur énergétique au niveau du, de l'avenir, mais également nous nous positionnons comme l'acteur de la transition énergétique en Méditerranée. Donc aujourd'hui, euh, je vous présente euh, les résultats du Mediterranean Energy Perspective. Et cette année, nous avons euh, fait réalisé deux scénarios. Et là encore, je vous présente les résultats tout à l'heure. Donc euh, on ne prend pas parti à l'OME, c'est-à-dire que les hypothèses que nous prenons, c'est les hypothèses de ce qui est en train 
de se dire ou de ce qui pourrait se faire. Et en l'occurrence, vous verrez que pour nous, le business as usual, donc la, la référence, c'est euh, qu'est-ce qui arriverait si les pays de la Méditerranée réalisaient complètement leur indices inconditionnel. On prend ça comme référence parce que c'est l'engagement que les pays ont pris et prennent, quelles que soient les conditions. Ensuite, pour la première fois, nous avons réalisé un scénario avec le soutien de la Commission européenne sur, et si on, on, on allait vers une décarbonation de la Méditerranée à l'horizon 2050, quel, quel serait le mix énergétique, quelles seraient les conséquences, et donc on compare euh, les, la différence entre les deux, sachant que l'un, c'est la... Ça correspond plus à la réalité. Et l'autre, c'est un défi auquel l'ensemble des pays souhaitent euh, arriver parce que s'engager dans le, le changement climatique et donc être acteur pour euh, réaliser cette décarbonation, surtout que la, la Méditerranée est connue pour être le hotspot du changement climatique. Donc, il y a un vrai engagement. Et je crois qu'ici, à la COP, on l'a vu, on l'a ressenti aussi à travers l'engagement des compagnies énergétiques qui sont nos membres aussi. Donc, je passe maintenant, euh, je voudrais aussi, pardonnez-moi, avant de passer à la présentation, vous, vous, vous présenter les, les grandes salutations de notre co-président, M. Adjal, qui est le PDG de Sonel Gaz, qui n'a malheureusement pas pu se joindre à nous, mais qui vous souhaite euh, la bienvenue également et euh, plein succès à, à nos travaux. Donc, euh, je vais présenter maintenant les résultats. Donc, next slide. S'il vous plaît. Donc là, je présentais euh, donc les deux scénarios. Le prochain, s'il vous plaît. Voilà. Donc là, vous avez les. I was with English. Yeah, that you're right. <laughs> uh, here you have um, what would the, the future look like in terms of energy demand by, by fuel, and uh, you see here uh, the reference scenario from one side and the promet scenario from the other side. So reference uh, is uh, achieving the. NDCs and conditional, and the other one, we will decarbonize the Mediterranean by 2050. Over the past three decades, energy demand increased by 43%, and, and their current trend would increase by 31% to 2050. To achieve a net zero carbon future by 2050, total Mediterranean energy demand will need to be reduced by a quarter from current levels, a challenging feat when considering that we will have more 130 million increase in the population in the Mediterranean, and this will be exclusively in the South Med, coupled with the doubling of GDP prospects over the same horizon. It is not just the level of demand that needs to be brought down, but also the fuel mix that needs to improve drastically. At present, fossil fuels account for 76% of the energy mix. The change in the mix and the decrease in energy demand overall will be driven substantially by the electrification of most end uses, with electricity accounting for 56% of total final consumption by 2050, compared to 22% currently. Renewables, although fast increasing, currently stand only at 12% of the total Mediterranean energy demand. In 2030, even if all NDCs are reached, fossil fuels will still account for 71% of the mix due to the inertia of transport and industry demand that cannot be hastily displaced. In a near zero carbon future, renewables will need to step up to reach 57% of the total mix by 2050. By 2050, the energy mix will need to be 57% renewables, 17% nuclear, and 26% fossil. 23% for gas, gas alone, so hydrocarbons mean gas for the Mediterranean region. Next, please. The situation is quite, quite contrasted across the two shores of the Mediterranean with an already declining energy demand in the north, where energy efficiency measures have already started to be enforced, coupled with falling population trends. While in the south, energy demand has been soaring and population and economic growth thriving. To reach carbon neutrality by 2050 in the North Mediterranean, energy demand will need to be reduced by a further 41%, while increase in demand in the South should be capped at under 2% to 2050 from current level. That's quite a challenge. 
In terms of fuel mix, at present, fossil fuels account for 65% in the north and 92% in the south of the energy mix. So this is our reality today. Currently, renewables, although fast increasing, stand at 15% in the north and barely reach 8% of total energy demand in the south. In 2030, even if all NDCs are reached, fossil fuels will still account for 80% of the energy mix in the south alone. And this is another reality. 52% in the north, due to the inertia of transport and industry demand that cannot be hastily displaced. In a net zero carbon future, renewables will need to step up to reach by 2050 around 60% of the energy mix in the north and 55% in the south. Gas will still play a role, albeit a less prominent one in the net zero future with a share of 12% in the north and 32% in the south, chiefly in power generation and industry. Nuclear will account for a quarter of the energy mix in 2050 in the north, with France steadying its reliance on nuclear generation with the placement of old reactors by new and more efficient ones and will stand at 11% in the south with the development of nuclear plants in several South Mediterranean countries, Egypt, Turkey, Jordan, and Morocco. Next, please. To avoid the worst climate impacts, greenhouse, green, global greenhouse gas emissions will need to reach net zero around mid-century. For the Mediterranean region, this means reducing carbon emissions nearly tenfold from 2,000 million tons currently to 255, 35 million, another challenge. The challenge will be substantial for all MET countries where current trends project a 21 increase of emissions by 2050, as opposed to need to actually reduce emissions by 89% from now to 2050. This is 15 less times less than current for the North, and this is six, six times less for the South. Energy efficiency and renewables will account for the bulk of the energy-related carbon emissions reduction, with energy efficiency expected to account to 46% of carbon reduction and renewables for 44%. However, to reach full decarbonization, green gases will be pivotal, and carbon capture technologies will also play a role, especially in the industry sector. Next, please. Energy efficiency will therefore be key in reducing CO2 emissions and achieving the PROMET scenario trajectory. Energy efficiency alone will help contribute to half all of emissions compared to the reference scenario by 2050. Within the energy system, the greatest contribution to CO2 mitigation will come from electricity generation and transport. The efforts will be considerable in all end use sectors where not only demand will need to be electrified and switched to more green usages, but will also need to be reduced drastically. The path to carbon neutrality would entail a reduction in end use energy consumption of 24% to 2050 current level, but an actual reduction of 42% compared to current trends exposed in the reference scenario. A carbon neutral future means that end use should already start being capped in the coming years. While final North Mediterranean energy demand has already been decreasing of the past decade, already minus 7% since 2010, South Mediterranean end use requirements have increased by 20% since 2010. To reach carbon neutrality, by 2050, in the North Mediterranean, energy demand will need to be reduced by a further 41% compared to current level, while increase in demand in the South Shore should be capped, as I said, at 2% from current level. All and use sectors will need to contribute to reduce emissions, increase energy efficiency and innovation, promoting improvements, notably in transport, building, agriculture, waste management, and industry. This reduction will be especially stringent in the air transport sector, where demand will need to be more than halved by 2050 compared to the reference scenario, meaning a total revamping of transport modes and organization of cities and transport. The rate of the demand transition is constrained by infrastructure inertia, meaning the end use equipment lifetime. The time required for infrastructure appliances turnover and the inertia under the inertia constraint 
implies that the process of electrification, for example, consumer adoption of electric vehicles and heat pumps must begin, must begin many years and even a decade before a fully electrified fleet is required to meet the net zero target. To keep up with the electrification of its end use, Mediterranean countries will need to increase substantially their power generation. Next, please. In the north, even in the north. Overall, Mediterranean power generation will need to increase by 11% to 2030 and by 30% to 2050. In the south, Mediterranean power generation will need to double by 2040 and nearly triple by 2050. The future of power generation is decidedly green. Presently, renewables account for 28% of total power generation, while 2050, they are expected to reach the lion's share of generation with a contribution of 78% in total generation. Both North and South Mediterranean countries will need to deploy their potential extensively. There will be 12% of generation from nuclear with the development of nuclear plants in several South Med countries and in the North. As I already told, go, <clears throat> sorry, gas will, stay, will still have a role accounting for 9% of total generation in, in 2050 compared to 33% today. Electricity storage will be paramount to the successful integration of renewables and the responsiveness of the electricity system to ensure the stability of network operation. By 2030, electricity storage will account for 1% of the generation and will reach 10% by 2050. The deployment and upgrading of transmission and distribution network will also be a key. Next, please. This increase in generation will be mirrored by the power capacity that will need to be added to existing infrastructures. Most capacity additions will stem from renewables and nearly all from solar and wind technologies. The bulk of renewable capacity additions is expected in the South Mediterranean countries. In parallel, fossil fuel power plants will need to be progressively shut down. Current solar capacity twin stands at 85 gigawatt in the total region. A 600 gigawatt will need additional capacity will need to be installed by 2050 of which about half, 350 in the South region. Wind technologies will also encounter striking capacity additions with a total net increase of nearly 500 gigawatt, of which 300 gigawatt in the South Mediterranean countries. Both onshore and offshore technologies will be deployed in the region. Today, the Mediterranean stands at the crossroad of multiple crises. The energy crisis is exposing the dangers of high energy dependence levels of the region on fossil fuels. North Mediterranean countries have always been heavily reliant on imported fossil fuels, and these levels reach over 60% in past years. The ongoing crisis is not just a European crisis, as also heavily fossil fuel dependent South Mediterranean countries are and being impacted. Furthermore, the economies of the South countries had already suffered greatly from the Arab Spring upheavals and the pandemic. South countries such as Morocco, Jordan, and Lebanon have energy dependence scores of over 90%. Under current trends, Mediterranean energy imports would only increase a 25% increase from current levels. This would be economically and geopolitically unsustainable. Currently, the war in Ukraine and political risks in the region seem to escalate. And while this is increasing havoc, it could also be the opportunity for countries around the Mediterranean to regroup and play a constructive role in mitigating the energy supply risks and in containing an accumulated the accumulated instability. The development of gas fields, solar and wind projects, and the execution of energy infrastructure projects through synergies with regional partners within a Mediterranean energy strategy would provide a win-win situation by which cooperation benefits to all. Moving towards a net zero carbon future will alleviate greatly fossil fuel dependence in the Mediterranean region, particularly in the North. By 2030, net fossil fuel imports would be more than half and the whole region 
would become a net fossil fuel exporter by 2040. This is largely due to increasing exports in the South Mediterranean region, which would make the region a net exporter by 2030. Next. So this has a cost. Scaling up the energy transition in line with the net zero emissions target, which of course has a cost and will be costly. To reach carbon neutrality in 2050, the investment need would, be, would exceed 6,700 billion euros. This is a near 7 trillion ticket to achieve climate goals and energy security in the Mediterranean region. Half of this investment will be needed in the South Mediterranean alone. The Mediterranean would need around 2,000 billion euros in investment between 2022 and 2030 to meet their NDC targets. Three quarters of these investments will, be, will need to be deployed in the 30, 2030 and 2050 decades. Half of the required investments will not target directly energy production, but rather energy efficiency and energy saving to fuel the energy efficiency measures. The power sector will account for nearly 40% of the required investment. Over a quarter of this will be transmission and distribution network and electricity storages, storage. Looking at direct investment, excluding energy efficiency investment, renewables will account for 70% of total investment needs and nuclear for 11%. Thus, a total of 81% of investments will go to non-carbonated energy supply. The remaining 19% on fossil fuels will be mainly for gas. Upstream, midstream, and refurbishment of gas plants with more efficient utilities, as gas is the cleanest fuel among hydrocarbons. Although the 240 billion euros per year needed to fuel the transition may seem daunting, it is not just the cost of energy and efficiency that needs to be taken into account to get the real picture. The cost of inaction would make a real mark on the Mediterranean's economy and population. Climate shocks could shrink economies, increase energy bills, reduce export revenues, increase poverty, and decrease real wages, not to mention the severe impact on agriculture, on food, on water. If the rest of the world decarbonizes and the Mediterranean does not, the cost of inaction would even be worsened. International private funding are therefore essential to meet this large investment need. However, various barriers in South countries, especially in terms of policies, continue to prevent international investors from becoming more engaged in the South region and in the renewable energy sectors. Against this backdrop, further support is required so that the South Met countries can meet their demands in a sustainable way to the benefit not only of the South, but also the North. Supporting sustainable energy development would, need, would indeed imply opening new businesses, opportunities for the Euro-Mediterranean energy companies to operate in rapidly growing market and promoting the export of European renewable energy technologies. This is already notably the case for wind power, a sector on which the South currently relies on important European technology. This would also allow to promote a more rapid economic development in the South which is a key prerequisite for expanding the region economic and trade relations with the North, with the positive geopolitical repercussion and trade relations with the North, uh, sorry, with the positive re geopolitical repercussion this would entail. Moreover, this would guarantee the stability of future gas exports from the South to Europe by allowing these countries to meet their growing electricity demand with renewables of, instead of gas. Freeing gas for export will enhance European Union gas security of supply, thus increasing the stability and security of the whole region. To conclude, under current auspices, with uncertainties and shortages fracturing long-standing trading relationship, the Mediterranean region risks seeing a reversal of decarbonization on which progress is already moving too slow. Underwind energy issues across the Mediterranean are plentiful. More cooperation is urgently needed to foster and achieve these synergy, synergies. Reducing consumption of fossil fuels and accelerating the decarbonization of economies by investing in innovative, green, and digital technologies, such as biofuels, hydrogen, electricity storage, carbon capture technology, smart grids, circular economy solutions, 
will strengthen the Mediterranean's energy security and strategic autonomy. It will also help achieve climate goals and provide the basic for, for sustainable economic growth. The European Green Deal is a considerable move for, in the right direction, but there is an urgent need to encompass the Mediterranean region as a whole and to invest more and faster to foster the much needed diversification of supply to effectively reduce climate change consequences and build a stronger, more autonomous and more competitive economy for the region. The conflict is in Ukraine makes this need only greater and more urgent. Given geographical proximity and century long historical ties, a close cooperation between government and private companies on the two sides of the Mediterranean to explore and develop all forms of energy will be mutually beneficial in these difficult times. Developing and utilizing all energy sources, and this is comprehensive, would benefit all parties. It is a win-win situation. Creating a more integrated Mediterranean energy market is of a primary importance to address the fast growing energy demand in the Southern Mediterranean countries while favoring low carbon and renewable energy sources and energy efficiency solutions. This means supporting reforms, pursuing market adequate regulation and providing the required funding and technical assistance. Mediterranean countries will benefit from adopting a specific and just regional strategy that brings together geoeconomic and energy to maintain independence and stability, leaving no one behind. Mediterranean Green Deal in this context emerged as a great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Huda, for a great presentation. Your Royal Highness, Princess Alize, uh, distinguished colleagues, it's my great pleasure to uh, start uh, this uh, panel. And we have actually a, a very nice combination of people that represents both the uh, private and also the public sector. And uh, we, I'm sure we will have some very interesting comments. So uh, first, I want to congratulate OME for the publication of the Mediterranean energy perspectives. This is once a year and it's getting richer and richer with scenarios and with very important figures for the region in terms of where should the region go and uh, what it would take in terms of investment. Uh, the, uh, also, um, I would like to, to highlight that uh, the, uh, this map is in the future going to involve other parts of the, uh, of the sustainability equation, which are water uh, and uh, other applications. So I want to start with LAPO, Pistelli. You have multiple hats. You are the Director of Public Affairs with ENI. Uh, you are the OME Chairman, and you are also on the board of IRENA, among other things. So I want to ask you, uh, one of the words that I heard the, the most from Houda is collaboration. Where do you see collaboration in the Mediterranean go uh, to be effective? Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so I'll use my, my first hat, so we have the ENI, because I, I guess that I'm supposed to speak at the end, changing my hat uh, as the chairman of AME. So first of all, thank you. And I would like br very briefly to just to position ENI on the on the MED map, uh, uh, because I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that everybody knows about the role that we are playing historically and actually in the region. So uh, any actually is an integrated energy company, but it's quite clear that while we are in transition, like all other IOCs, our core uh, business is still linked to oil and gas. And uh, um, basically we are the first player in the region because we are the first energy player in, in Algeria, in Tunisia, in Libya, in Egypt. And given the, the good perspective about exploration that are happening in Cyprus and maybe in Lebanon, uh, we could become also the first player in those two countries. So it's quite clear that we, we are playing a role. Um, I have the second issue I have to say uh, that 
because everybody, I mean, we, here we are at the COP, so it's quite clear that all of the focus is about transition and how to carb emissions and so on. But because uh, ENI is the first IOCs or energy company in Africa, in the whole African continent, I have to stress, uh, usually my friends from Algeria, Egypt, and, 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 and whatever are doing that game, but I, I'll, do, I'll do it on their behalf. We, have, we still have a, a large part of Africa which lacks dramatically access to energy. Uh, so if you go to Sub-Saharan Africa, where we are, uh, you have countries in which 85, 87, 90 percent of the people have no access to energy. So I, I can tell you here at the COP that if you talk to them about transition, they will insult you and they are right, because the, the, the big issue for them is access, it's not transition. They don't have anything, any, any, any energy to transit from and to, they need access. When you are in the northern strip of the continent in Africa, you can feel and I wouldn't blame them for that, a sort of, let me tell you, a fossil pride, where fossil pride means everybody has access to energy. And this is a big difference if, if you compare these countries and the rest of the continent. So that said, are we going to remain there, stuck forever and ever in this uh, energy scenario? No. Uh, Huda gave us so many contents to say what we have to do, and she explained very clearly uh, how big uh, is the gap that we have we have to fulfill. So uh, it, it's a really, I mean, uh, it's a headache uh, to go from here to there. Uh, but let me tell you how how the situation is changing very briefly. The situation is changing because, on the one hand, uh, I see um, not not only in theoretical way but in practical way, and the last two years are there to show that what I'm saying is true. Uh, much more ground for cooperation between the north and the south of the Med. Why? Because on the one hand, you see uh, the north is uh, decreasing its consumption, is decreasing uh, its, uh, it, its emission, but on the other hand, has the need to change the map of uh, routes and suppliers because of the war, because of Russia, and so on. And so, I mean, we are happy because we, are, we were already playing this role, but even now the EU Commission is understanding that I would say the destiny of the EU security of supply is linking to the South, to Africa. For too, too much time, we thought only in terms of Russia and Norway and the North Sea system, while the destiny of the two continents is linked together. And talking as an Italian, an Italian, I'm happy to say that, I mean, I'm also geographically very close to this new corridor that is happening. Uh, secondly, um, if, you, if you look, uh, always positioning ENI on the northern side, we are in Italy decreasing our activity and we are enlarging new activities in France and in Spain, making a lot of renewables and expanding our utilities activities. But in the south, uh, uh, in Algeria, in Egypt, in this country, a lot of talks, and not only talks, are happening about the way to transform energy in these countries. That means, first of all, how to work on the upstream uh, project uh, uh, abating emissions and methane fugitive. Uh, ENI has a target, and we are, I mean, in advance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the target to be uh, carbon neutral in scope one and two, so upstream activities in a few years from now. So I would say three, four years, we will be globally uh, carbon neutral in scope one and two. But you know that the big issue in the ENP activities is not about the scope one and two, it's about scope three, so the emission of the customers. So this will be the big deal in the next 15, 20 years. But we will be uh, carbon neutral scope one and two, and this is happening because of a new way to run the project in Algeria, in Egypt, trying to carb to zero uh, emissions and basically coping with uh, the knock in, uh, in these countries about uh, producing renewables, firstly, to, uh, for self-consumption. And secondly, when the grid is okay, and when the grid is available to provide renewable energies to the national grid as far as we are providing gas to the domestic grid. And secondly, working on new vectors and sources 
everybody here is talking about hydrogen. We know that hydrogen is an issue. Let me tell you very frankly that this is not a low hanging fruit. This is not something that is going to be used uh, in a few years from now. I mean, there is a potential for hydrogen, but there's no demand. Actually, there's no demand. There's no demand in those countries. There's no demand in Europe. So we are, we are working about the infrastructure, the potential, uh, research about new ways to use hydrogen in transports, but actually there's no demand. We are the biggest producer and consumer of hydrogen in Italy, but we are self-consuming the hydrogen in our activities. That's it. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, so I'll give you back the micro. Um, I do think this is maybe more suitable for, for one of the conclusions, but let me anticipate this one. Um, there's a new debate about nuclear. We are not involved in nuclear, even though our CEO is a nuclear physician. Um, I see how in the OME scenario, you see a certain percentage of nuclear, which is almost stable in all of the, country, in all of the, of the two scenarios, because on, on the northern side, you mean France, that's it. And in the southern side, uh, in the southern side, Egypt uh, makes the most, and then you have Morocco and Turkey and so on. I think that if we want to get uh, carbon free by 2050, we need breakthrough technologies that are needed, not now, but maybe in the 30s or in the 40s. Because otherwise, I mean, that could come on stream in the next 10 or 15 years. So that's my first comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lapo, for this very comprehensive answer. And what we have seen from ENI is an absolute transformation over the last 10, 15 years into such a vast uh, variety of, uh, of energy vectors. Uh, in my home country, Tunisia, ENI partnered with the national uh, oil company, uh, ETAP, to develop the first uh, renewable solar project in the country. So, uh, and <clears throat> that's a, a, a great uh, contribution. I'm going to move to Mr. Mohamed Al-Khayat, who is the executive president of NREA um, from Egypt. And uh, thank you very much, first, for the hospitality <laughs> COP27. Alhamdulillah, has been a great, great success. And I hope by the end of this week, we will have plenty of announcements, inshallah. So uh, for you, I mean, we have heard throughout the week, but also for the previous weeks, a number of announcements in Egypt towards the uh, sustainable energy future. Uh, and Egypt would have some of the largest uh, solar uh, projects in the world, actually. So where do you see Egypt going in this context? And how does it contribute to the Mediterranean future? Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. And thank you very much for inviting me for uh, this session and among the distinguished panelists. Also, we do welcome all of you in, in Egypt and in Sharm el-Sheikh and hope uh, you are pleasant to stay, inshallah. Uh, let me start first from the terminology of the energy transition. What I do believe really energy transition is a process in progress from the day one on this planet until the end. The difference is before it was a business as usual. Now there are specific targets and we are working on it and we are searching for synergies, how could we uh, mobilize all the efforts toward this, achieving this energy transition and consequently 
have a specific goals such as net zero or uh, zero carbon or something like this. So this is yani, just a comment regarding the energy transition. So consequently, and based on this, we do believe in future that we will see different models and techniques for the energy. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, no one could believe that solar energy in specific could have a certain share in the energy portfolio. It was around 15, 16, even 20 cents US dollar per kilowatt hour. But what has been done during this period is totally a shift in the paradigm of the solar market. And the same persons who said we couldn't invest in photovoltaic now are digging the earth to invest in solar energy. And this is from one side gives us that we need not to stop at a certain or at, at the current vision that we have. We have only specific tools to judge future, but we do believe or we must believe that future will have different tools which will change dramatically the market of energy. Consequently, and based on this, and uh, the dynamics, let me say, which we already witnessed, witnessed in, in the COP27 in a specific regarding the GIGA projects, which have been uh, the uh, agreements or MOUs already signed within the last uh, couple of days. Yes, it seems by the current criteria and laws impossible. But I am sure that at a certain date, we will see it as reality. And this will take me regarding some specific messages based on this. Really, we already transferred from the mega scale of projects toward this giga scale. For sure, this will be coupled with a lot of consequences on the production rate of the manufacturers of renewable energy. There will be more demand. There will be some of these projects to be coupled with localization of some equipments in the countries which are enriched with uh, uh, renewable energy sources. And consequently, we will see different um, renewable energy is, is skeleton in the, in the future. And it will be shifted and instead of having a photovoltaic or a renewable energy project just to be to generate electricity and to be sent to the grid to be a captive project, just a project to feed a specific load. And this will take us toward this really the, the green hydrogen, green ammonia, e-methanol, and even water desalination. In Egypt, we already launched around 15 projects for water desalination to be powered by renewable energy. And consequently, when we look what has been done during the last couple of days and uh, the gigawatt, which could be installed to provide or to, to supply or to, to, to feed these. Sorry for this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, to feed the, the, the projects represent from one side it represents the the uh, uh, potential opportunity for renewable energy really to play a major role in the future and the relations which might be uh, already established between the Mediterranean countries from south to north and vice versa. And uh, uh, this for sure will, will, will be coupled with a lot of job opportunities and uh, 
strengthen the relations between those countries and consequently uh, be coupled with, with what I can say, uh, new opportunities for renewable energy. This from one side regarding the green uh, hydrogen, green ammonia, green methanol. But in, in addition to that, we need to focus only, uh, to focus also on the energy efficiency. We must not forget energy efficiency. And uh, two days ago, uh, me and uh, Dr. Huda was in a, in, 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 in a session regarding energy efficiency, and we still see that there is a, a, a huge opportunity in this regard. It might need the maestro who could orchestrate the market for energy efficiency. Unfortunately, there is no yani, a specific entity to take this role, but also we need to think uh, uh, with, uh, about the energy efficiency in addition to also the renewable energy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Al Khayat, for these uh, very comprehensive points. And you have touched on many of the aspects, most on the generation, the storage, but also on the use side. So I'm going to turn to uh, our third panelist, uh, and uh, this is uh, Matteo. Uh, so you are the Infrastructure Development Director for Edison for uh, gas and LNG but you also have another hat as the chairman of the finance committee of the OME. So from the figures that we have seen from Huda, $6.7 trillion, $2 trillion between now and 2030, that's huge. So where do we see this infrastructure coming from? I mean, your company is involved in some part uh, what do you need to have those projects on the ground? Thank you, Kamel, and uh, thank you for uh, your hospitality. It's a great pleasure to share with you my, my view on, uh, on the energy sector and the Mediterranean Sea. I think uh, UDA provide uh, in a very few minutes a very comprehensive picture of the region. And first of all, I, I would say that we have to think to the Mediterranean Sea as a unique country, a unique P, if I can say. Um, I agree with Lapo. There is north and south, and uh, there are the ing ingredients to make a nice results, to make the, this, this country, this region, self-sustainable. Because I think the first point is to make the Mediterranean Sea self-sustainable before to say environmental sustainable because without being self-sustainable it's quite difficult to be sustainable also from an environmental point of view. About infrastructure, my company Edison is the oldest energy company in Europe. We work in several sectors of the energy chain. We are involved in, in electricity production. We are also part of huge project of interconnection. Uh, we are working to interconnect the Mediterranean Sea. I, I see that in the north of Europe, well, infrastructure are there, and they're for sure helping this energy crisis. If I look to the south of the Mediterranean Sea, something is still missing in my opinion. So it's very good the announcement of all the agreements that we are seeing about new project about hydrogen. I agree with LAPO, we need a little bit of more pragmatism in the realization. It's not viable to make this kind of infrastructure just by industrial companies. Uh, we have it to do with the support of all the nation, countries, institution, and financial body. Only with, if we join the efforts, we can reach the target that is challenging. I take just a few, few numbers that come from uh, with the presentation. Uh, okay, a 7 trillion euro ticket to, to reshape the region. This is the cost. Uh, but before to say that, let, let's see the region. The region today is a net import of energy. 
and it's crazy <laughs> because the energy is already there in the region. We have not to import, we have to valorize it. So how to do that? This is the first question. And I think this could, we can find where and how to make it in our capabilities. There are already there also in our industry. We have to valorize it. We have to valorize the natural gas that is available in the region and to use it to make possible to make the transition, to make possible to accommodate a renewable. Um, this is, in my, in my opinion, the way, uh, mm. Kamel. I think uh, Egypt is doing a lot. And uh, I would say thank you for uh, uh, their hospitality. And uh, I, I would promote the fact that in the next month, I hope with the OMI, there will be the opportunity to talk about not only about figures, but maybe also about new idea, new projects that could help this path. Thank you very much, uh, Matteo. So uh, if we look at the, uh, at the region as, as a whole, you, you, you mentioned uh, that it's a net importer and then there is such a big potential. Okay, so now how do we put it in action? What are the levers? And this is really the big question and this will be supported by the excellent analysis of the OME. I'm going to ask Lapo to provide some concluding remarks uh, about his vision for the future. So now I'm changing my head. Okay, so I'm, I'm talking on behalf of the OME. I'm supposed to do that. So um, let's try to be brief because I know that time is running short. Uh, first of all, we we love the Med Basin not only because we I mean we belong to the Basin, but also uh, because I think uh, that the Basin is playing and will play in the future a geopolitical role which is larger than we we do believe about it. Just just let me give you one one data. Um, in, in our scenario, we, we, we largely take into consideration all, all of the emissions of the country, of the countries facing the basin in the north and in the south. But if you uh, look uh, at, the, at the sea in itself, which is less than 1% of the global sea of the world, but in which you have from 15 to 20% of the global shipping traffic, and this percentage, this number of carriers, of container uh, cargos and so on, is going to increase in the next 10 years. So it's relevant for us, but it's also more relevant for the world. Uh, usually, I am used to look at the basin in the traditional, I was used to look at the basin uh, with a traditional perspective of a basin which is connecting north to south. But if you extend your view and you extend your perspective and you see um, uh, the Gibraltar Channel and the Suez Canal, you see that this is becoming also a connection between the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean uh, through the platform of the Gulf. So it's becoming really, uh, I would say, a membrane which is embracing not only the north-south dimension, but also the east-west dimension. Otherwise, you couldn't explain why not only the Americans, but also the Chinese, the Russians, the Turkish, everybody's looking at the basin. The basin is a really pivotal, geopolitically speaking. Secondly, I, uh, I spend 20 seconds to, I would say, uh, to emphasize again uh, the role of the energy of today in delivering uh, energy access and also transition. Uh, the Med Basin, especially the East Med, uh, has become well known in the last eight, 10 years for its new gas discoveries. Um, gas, as you all know, is considered the, the, the transition uh, source uh, for energy. But I would like to emphasize how gas discovery has dramatically changed the energy mix of some of the countries which are facing the, the basin. Take the case of Jordan that was heavily relying a few years ago on, oil, on fuel oil, and now has a mix which is composed by renewables and gas. Look at what happened in Israel, 
look at, we, at which are the expectations in Cyprus and in Lebanon, where there is actually a heavy dependency on very polluting uh, fossil fuels, while the gas discovery could uh, help the, com the countries to transit to a new energy mix. Third comment, uh, usually in the 20th century, uh, I mean, energy has always been an argument and a topic to, to wage wars. Uh, I could say that in the last 10 years, uh, energy has become in the Met Basin an, ex an excellent diplomatic tool for make peace. So if you look at the Eastern part of the Met Basin, you will see the typical success story which is Israel and Egypt uh, um, uh, managing and running together some of the discoveries and sharing infrastructures. And if you see at recent news, you will see how the recent uh, settlement of a maritime dispute between Israel and Lebanon could provide, I mean, a better environment to uh, further exploration and, uh, and development of the gas in the region. If that is true, uh, this is time for new infrastructure. New infrastructure means, on the one hand, uh, scaling up or upgrading existing infrastructure. There are a lot of thoughts about the right size of the already existing uh, facilities which are connecting the basin, uh, the traditional Maghreb ones, I would say, uh, Algeria, Spain, Algeria, Italy, Libya, Italy, the new one, those uh, that the, that um, the one that which is connecting the Caspian Sea uh, to Greece and then to to Italy, the tap, and you know that there is a reflections about doubling it, and then you have a number of new infrastructure that are on the table, uh, the infrastructure connect the electricity, uh, the, the electric line connecting Tunisia to Italy, a potential gas and hydrogen fitting. Uh, infrastructure connecting Spain and Italy, skipping France. You have the East Med pipe, which is at the same time gas, hydrogen, or electricity, depending on the way you look at that. So we understand that, I mean, there's a, a lot of room for increasing uh, connectivity, I would say, between the two shores. And if that is true, um, I think that OME, but not only OME, I would say the government could take profit of some of the platforms. We are, we are one of that of those platforms where not only energy producers and so companies from the north and from the south, but also carriers uh, and regulators are, cop are coping together from the north and from the south. So there are, there's a critical mass of people dealing with energy, producing energy, transporting energy, regulating energy from the north and from the south. And last but not least, because, I mean, uh, the EU Commission uh, has, a, I would say, a bold uh, um, um, nearer policy in which for many, uh, for many years uh, going back, uh, there, there were instruments and financing for the ring of friends and to provide also energy cooperation. I think that we have really to involve not only the national government and, 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 the, and the producing companies, but also the international institutions which are looking at the MED as a lab, as a real lab. You know, I'll, I'll finish by, by saying that. Uh, reading, uh, reading newspapers and scrolling online news in these very days, uh, you see that there is a lot of debate about the outcome of this COP27. Somebody is disappointed because uh, they were waiting for new announcement, new targets. Uh, there, is this, there is this big issue of loss and damages. Uh, there's new uh, uh, attention for financing the transition. You are counting who is missing, why China is not here, and so on and so forth. But that said, I do believe that if we wanted to be pragmatic, uh, and we need to be pragmatic, we can't expect from every conference of the parties new targets, new targets, new targets without questioning if we were able to get to the target we delivered a few years ago, if there is somebody lagging behind, why this is happening, how we could help and push those who are lagging behind and help them. So we have, in my view, to depackage the big picture and to go for smaller picture. And the MED is a small picture, but it's a relevant small picture 
in which we can focus our efforts and our attention, North and South, African Union and EU Commission and the European Union, and try, first of all, to get the job done here where we are. And I think this is a very effective way to look at the global picture, trying to implement at least the part of the world in which we all live. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lapo, for this great point. So I just wanted to highlight that 4.15 today at the Mediterranean Pavilion, this uh, discussion will be continued. Time is for action now. If you look at the Mediterranean, we used to have four nice seasons. Now we are going more and more into two seasons. Last year in Sicily, beautiful island, 49 degrees C, that has never happened in history. In Tunis, 52 degrees. So the time is for action now. And what we are seeing on the positive side is we have seen some great progress on collaboration. The East Med Gas Forum under the chairmanship of Egypt is a great example of people putting together political issues and creating a, a collaboration framework. Uh, this week, I heard some amazing news that uh, Jordan will be providing electricity based on solar to Israel and Israel will be providing desalinized water to, uh, to Jordan. So these are the kind of collaboration that will make a sustainable future. With that, I want to thank our panelists, our distinguished, very distinguished participants for a great session. Thank you so much.